everybody doing oh my camera's a little bit that's oh, fine it's fine this has been a while since we've had one of the pious streams you guys have been i've been getting um threats of oracles of woe and judgment for taking so long to post the next installment of this it seems like you guys really enjoy the pious streams it's been three weeks i just checked it the other day and i and I knew that I just had to do the next episode. Good evening, ba Christian based Wagner. Oh, good evening, Sean. Man, I've been waiting for this. Well, today, uh, if you remember last time, we went over him being the Bishop of Mantua. I think that's how you pronounce it. I think I remember. It's been three weeks. It's been a while. But now we're going to get over. Um, we're going to get over. We're going to go over his uh, position as the Patriarch of Venice. So what you have to realize before we start is that in the late 19th century, the position of the Patriarch of Venice was one of the most important positions in the church. It was seen as one of the greatest dignities, which was held uh, usually by one of the cardinals. So this position uh, came with uh, great influence, great power, um, and it was just a very important position in the church. But in New Year's Eve of 1891, Cardinal Agnostino, the Patriarch of Venice, died. And Pope Leo XIII, he had his eyes on Pius. But Pope Leo XIII actually, uh, before this, had offered the position to somebody else in 1892. And he knew that, uh, well, um, I'll finish the story. The, the person who he had offered it to was a very sickly man and decided to reject the offer due to his illness, but agreed to be the guy in charge while they looked for somebody else. But Pope Pius XIII, uh, he knew that Pius was extremely humble and would probably reject his offer for such an exalted role as the Patriarch of Venice. Because remember, the Bishop of Mantua wasn't exactly uh, the highest position in the church. So it would have been a bit odd for the Bishop of Mantua to be offered the position of the Patriarch of Venice. It usually would have went to one of the cardinals or some other uh, very important person in the church. So uh, Pius, um, he actually... Uh, did not reject it. But the reasoning was because Pope Leo XIII intensely uh, bound him. He bound him on pain of obedience to become the Patriarch of Venice. So obviously, uh, Pius, as we've mentioned before, he had a very good trait of obedience to his superiors. So Pius uh, uh, very regretfully agreed to become the Patriarch of Venice because he didn't see himself as being worthy of the position. And this is something that you see happening over and over again with other saints of the church. I was just reading the other day about the life of St. Robert Bellarmine. Um, and St. Robert Bellarmine also did not want to be a cardinal and tried his hardest to refuse the role of a cardinal because he knew that it would be a uh, something which would play to his own pride. So Cardinal Bellarmine um, tried to go against the Pope at the time, but the Pope bound him by obedience, and St. Bellarmine, Bellarmine decided to agree to this. 
So in May of 1893, so this was a year and a half after the last Patriarch of Venice died, it was announced that Pius had been elected to the position of the Patriarch of Venice and that he soon would be made a cardinal also. So on June 15th, that is when he went to Rome and then was made a cardinal and was installed by Pope Leo XIII as the Patriarch of Venice. And while he was in Rome, it's very interesting because we see over and over again in Pius's life how, how personable uh, Pius was. And he made friends with everybody when he went to Rome. Everybody was, was all of a sudden Pius's best friend and they all loved him because he was just a great guy to be around. He must, he must have been a wonderful guy to go out and get coffee with or just to, just to talk to. Pius was, uh, was that kind of guy. So uh, interestingly enough, this is this is one of in, one of the most interesting uh, parts of the story that I've read so far uh, in the life of Pius. Following this appointment, Pius had a 15 month fight with the Italian government. The Italian government uh, really didn't like the church at this time after the revolution. If you remember, there was the uh, the uh, Vatican prisoners, the uh, uh, that that occurred uh, the uh, I think it was Pope um, I think it was Pope Pius IX through if I'm remembering correctly Pope Pius the Eleventh who were regarded as the prisoners of the Vatican because the Italian government had taken their land and then the the popes decided that they weren't going to agree that the Italian government was a valid government. So there was, it was in the midst of all this mess of fights uh, because of the uh, Freemasonic influence on the Italian government of the time. So the Italian government really didn't like Pius and really didn't like the church. So they decided they were just going to uh, reject the fact that he was the Patriarch of Venice. They were going to say that the government had the right to appoint somebody, not the Pope. So this fighting went on, and they just said, no, Pius, you can't go to Venice to become the Patriarch of Venice. So there was a 15-month fight between those. So he had some time on his hands since he was uh, busy fighting the Italian government um, for his post as Patriarch of Venice. So he decided to go back as, as the absolute gigachad that was Pius. The first thing he did when he was made a cardinal of the church and Patriarch of Venice was he went to his hometown and visited his mom. And as he entered the town, the entire town was extremely excited uh, because remember, if you remember from the from the first episode of this, he grew up in an extremely poor town. So to have a cardinal of the church uh, be from that town was was a huge accomplishment. And everybody just came out and uh, went to Pius and uh, just just hung out with him for for a week or two. And he got to see his mom, which was great, because this was actually the last time that he was able to see his mom before he had died. So then after he went to go visit his mom, he had to go to uh, his former cathedral because, he, again, he was busy fighting the Italian government. And the Italian government wouldn't let him go to Venice to be the Patriarch of Venice. So he decided to just go back to his formal, former cathedral and to lay low for a while. And um, again, when he went to the town, everybody just, uh, just, just went out and visited him. So it's interesting the the type of things that the that the prime minister of Italy said about the church um, at, at, at this time, and I I would like to read a very uh, very funny quote that I found from the prime minister who was the head of the Freemasons, so very bad guy. He said, "quote The Vatican will fall beneath the blows of our vivifying hammer. Let us work with all our strength to scatter its stones, that we may build with them a temple." To an emancipated nation. The enemy is the Pope. We must wage a relentless war against him. The papacy, although but a phantom presiding over ruins, yet reflects a certain glory, waving as it does in the face of, and in defiance of the world, the cross and the Summa Theologica. A miserable crowd still prostrates, prostrates itself to adore. It must be a war to the knife. So uh, the, the glory of the cross and the Summa that that is that is what the church uses to fight the world. Oh, so I I have some 
I have some comments. Let me let me just wait real quick, and uh, we'll look at these comments. I ordered F.A. Forbes' biography on St. Pius X. Yes, that is that is the main resource that I use for this. It's it's a great one. He he. What what I love about Forbes' biography on uh, Pope St. Pius X is that Forbes just has such a way of like putting things. It's great. Can you compare Pius X with Patriarch Olistus of Ostia? Didn't think so. <laughs> I cannot. I'm just a chump. Typical Freemasonry cringe. Yeah, have they ever written a response to the Summa? No, that's what I thought. Wait and wait until if they read response to the Summa, then, then maybe I'll take them serious. And then the absolute Giga Chad, Pius, he responded to this. God is driven out of politics by this theory of the separation of church and state. He is driven out of art by the degrading influence of realism. From the laws by a morality which is guided by the senses alone. From the schools by the abolition of religious instruction. From Christian marriage now deprived of the grace of the sacrament. From the poor hut of the peasant who groaning under the burden of poverty is taught to disdain the help of him who alone can make his hard life bearable. From the palaces of the rich who are no longer taught to fear the eternal judge who will one day ask from them an account of their stewardship. We must fight this great error of modern times, the enthronement of man in the place of God. The solution of this, as of all other problems, lies in the church and her teaching. So uh, now the uh, pious had actually defeated the the stupid Freemasons. The all all of the the virgin Freemasons were destroyed by the Gigachad pious. So he decided to make his way on to Venice because he had been hanging out at the cathedral of Mantua at this time. So he stopped for a two, few days in Treviso, which if you remember, he served uh, there at the seminary um, and he was received again. Everybody just, just came out and, and threw a big old party and everybody took off work for the day and everything. But when Pius got to Venice, the, the people of Venice were, they were absolutely fumed. They were enraged at the Italian government for keeping him away. So this is going to be very important. So because they were so mad at the Italian government, the entire city decided to take the day off of work. And they formed just massive crowds to welcome Pius. Like you see firsthand accounts of this. People were just like, like, you know, the old pictures where you'll, you'll see people that are like hanging on like the edges of bridges to see the person. And they're just like in like on top of buildings so they could gather like that. It was that sort of thing with the with the coming of Pius, because everybody was just extremely angry at the Italian government because they kept them away uh, because Pius just absolutely got all of the love of the people. And then the the stupid Freemasons were were over there. uh pouting they, they didn't even show up and they met, that made the people even more mad so the people also decided in order to um in order to uh welcome pious even more they decided to decorate every single building in the city for pious but they purposefully skipped all of the government buildings so they decorated every single building except the buildings owned by the government in order to show how much they disliked the government. So it was it was great. Absolute, uh, absolute love for the church over the state. It was beautiful. So there was there was ringing of bells, crowds in the streets. Uh, and then it, which makes it even worse for the government. The Navy showed up like the the local the local uh, base of the Navy decided to all come out in their Navy uniforms and to, to do stuff uh, to celebrate Pius coming in. So the, the Venetian government couldn't even get their own military to be on their side. The military was so happy about Pius that they all went out and decided to celebrate Pius coming into town. So they got absolutely just destroyed in front of the eyes of everybody. And they just stayed at home and pouted. And everybody got even more angry at them. 
So the next morning of his arrival uh, in Venice to be uh, to have the massive installation at the cathedral, a bunch of people gave gave speeches about how much they loved Pius. Everybody showed up at the cathedral again because they all loved Pius. And then Pius gave this speech. So I'd, I'd like to quote the speech. So, quote, I should be ashamed to be the object of such honor. Did I not know that it is offered not to my poor person, but to Jesus Christ, whose representative I am? and whose name I come among you. You wish to show me that you see in me your bishop, your father, and your patriarch. And I am bound to love you in return. When Jesus Christ gave to St. Peter the charge of his sheep and of his lambs, he asked him three times for the assurance of his love, thus giving him to understand that love is the greatest necessity for a pastor of souls. From this moment, I gather you all into my heart. I love you with a strong and supernatural love, desiring only the good of your souls. For you are all my family, priests, citizens, great and small, rich and poor. My heart and my love are yours. And from you, I ask nothing but the same love in return. My only desire is that you should say of me, our patriarch is a man of upright intention, one who holds high the banner of our Lord Jesus Christ who seeks nothing but to defend the truth and to do good. And since God has raised me a son of the people to this high dignity, he will certainly give me the strength and the grace necessary for so great a mission. It is the duty of a bishop to proclaim God's truth, to interpret it to the people. And I look upon it as a holy duty to speak frankly, frankly in its defense. I'm ready to make any sacrifice for the salvation of souls. You who have zeal for the things of God, work with me, come to my assistance, and God will give us the grace that is necessary to achieve our ends. So that was that was Pius's speech at the um, at the massive installation. And I will check the check the uh, the chat real quick. Italians aren't real. Italians are a myth. Delu Bach debunked the Summa? No, Delu... Ah. In, in the words of Father Lagrange, it is evident that Father Delu Bach has never explained the Summa article by article. What about Patriarch Jacobus Album? I have no idea about Patriarch Jacobus Album. I am, I am just a, a dummy on the internet who doesn't know about all these people. Imagine people greeting their bishops like that today. Yeah, I, I did notice that when I was when I was reading, when I was reading a lot of these sources, it made me kind of made me sad. Is like most people, I, I have a feeling, couldn't even name their bishop, and if they could name them, like how many things do they actually know about their bishop? Like, do they they don't have that same great reverence and love for their bishops? Like when the bishop, I don't know, of of Baltimore is is uh installed you don't get a like a train of people who are who are coming um to to greet the bishop of baltimore it's just super sad and it's lame give me one okay i'm back sorry about that i propose using adulterous instead of virgin as an insult when talking of secularists yeah i you know what i'm going to make that a thing i'm just going to call them the adulterous italian government versus the giga chad uh pope pius oh Jacobus album equals james white oh i get it now i get it now i was just being dumb I was being dumb. Where is the debunking? I'm not debunking anyone. <laughs> Christian <laughs> pretending not to understand the meme just so Canadian Catholic would keep throwing money away. <laughs> no, no, I actually was just being dumb right there and not understanding, not understanding the meme. Okay, let's get back to it. So uh, the, the cool thing about Pius is he actually still kept up the practice that he had he had long had where he would keep the doors of the Episcopal palace always open. So you could be any, any priest, 
any layman, and you could be anybody, and just go to the Episcopal Palace and just have a meeting with Pius and just lay before him your issues or your problems. And throughout this time, he kept up his his absolute uh, giga chattery, and he fought he fought the uh, the capitalists, which were abusing the people. He fought the communists. He fought the politicians. He really fought everybody. And in fighting them, interestingly enough, in uh, he got all of their love. So the the Venetian government, who hated Pius to begin with, turned around and loved Pius. So you had the Venetian government, who was just a big fan of Pius now, because he just, everybody who met Pius just somehow loved him, and it was great. And he settled the disputes between the people because uh, with the capitalists and communists that he were fighting, obviously they hated each other. And during this time, uh, with all of the interesting politics of late 19th century Europe, uh, there was a lot of fighting that occurred. And he settled disputes between everybody and uh, Venice turned into a very peaceful place. And during this time, he turned to a new focus. Um, and, and his focus was really at this time on the teaching of doctrine. He he actually has a, uh, a section from a speech that he gave. No, no, it was a letter. I think it was a letter that he wrote to his priests where he told them like uh, in, in some stop, uh, stop preaching so much and, and begin teaching. Like you, you're exhorting and exhorting and exhorting. But they, these people have no idea um, about even the basics of the truth of truths of faith sometimes. So he really reformed uh, Venice into a place where um, catechesis was focused on very strongly, where priests would teach doctrinally a lot more in their homilies and such, where uh, where the priests were informed a lot more on, on the truths of faith. He, he saw the education of the Christian as something which was very important. And then again, he he kept up the same. Um, I feel like we keep repeating the the same uh, attributes of Pius, just in different situations. But he got even more money as a cardinal and patriarch of Venice, so he just had more money to just give away. He would give away money all the time, and he was dirt poor. He decided not to hire any servants, but he brought in his sister and his two nieces to to take care of the day to day of of his household. So he was very strict about money and he and he saved as much money as he could in order to just give it away. And then sometimes he would give away too much money. He would even go to the local pawn shop and would pawn the patriarchal ring, the ancient patriarchal ring of Venice. Uh he would pawn it off in order to give money to the poor if they needed it. It was it was very uh he he lived a very um strict rule of life let's just let's just have it at that he definitely was not one who was just focused on the mere uh, ecclesiastical honors he was truly a humble and, and pious man so during this time also he was very big on uh, eucharistic devotion he kept that at the forefront of his ministry and he had a eucharistic congress and the purpose of the eucharistic congress was in order to um, to make reparations for all of the uh, all of the dishonor which had been given to the Eucharist, and he said during this um, in in his speech, "quote Jesus is our King, and we delight to honor as our King Him whom the world dishonors and disowns. We, His true subjects, offer our true homage to Christ the King. The intensity of our love shall be greater than the coldness of the world." We uh, meet around the tabernacle where Jesus remains in our midst until the end of time, where faith springs up anew in our hearts, while the fire of his charity, the very fire that he came to cast upon the earth, diffuses itself within us. The object of this Eucharistic Congress is to make reparation to our Lord Jesus Christ for the insults offered to him in the Blessed Sacrament, to pray that his thoughts may be in our minds, his charity in our into into it, institutions, his justice in our laws, his worship in our religion, his life in our lives, end quote. And this, the procession at this Eucharistic Congress is, was described with such glory is actually, you know what, I didn't have the description in my notes, but I may just try to look for it, because it was kind of insane 
just the amount of people that were in this procession. We need to bring back uh, processions like this. Um, let me, I need to find this now that I said I was going to find it. But yeah, he, he actually has more giga chattery um, after this. So on the afternoon of the third day, the procession that ended the Congress was one of the most magnificent of all the magnificent pageants ever seen in the city of the sea. Um, Cardinal Savampa carried the monstrance, while before and after him went cardinals in scarlet, priests and bishops in cope and mitre, religious orders, the various co-fraternities with their banners and insignia, insignia, prelates and priests of the Greek, Melkite, and Armenian rites, and their gorgeous vestments, splendid as a dream, wrote one that was present. It seemed as if the very Greek saints had stepped out of the mosaics in the cathedral to be present as the solemn at the solemn passage of Christ in their midst. So also, uh, the, the, something which was very interesting is, uh, it, and kind of based, had to do with his reform of church music. So at this time in, in Venice, they had uh, basically an opera singer who was their cantor. They would have a female opera singer who would chant these various pieces uh, of the mass and uh, it was impossible to sing. It was it was just, you know, you know how it is with opera singers. But Pius, he, uh, and he later wrote an encyclical about this as Pope. He said, no woman canters. Stop having female canters. Haven't you read St. Paul that, that he does not permit um, a woman to speak in the congregation of God? He's like, no females. If you guys need to get choirs. And in these choirs, if you need higher voices, get boys, but do not get females to be to be singing um, in front of the congregation. So that was that was something that he had um, he had emphasized very strongly. So um, he also banned uh, drums, trumpets, tambourines whistles and the only instrument that he would allow to be in the churches was the organ and even with the organ he said that it would only be used sparingly in his reform of church music and he and he uh mandated that the mass be sung in gregorian chant by only men and boys no no women allowed no women allowed and he brought back the mass of uh, uh palestrina which if you've never heard the Mass of Palestrina, um, I think it's the uh, Misa um, de Papa Mikhail, or um, I, I, th I think that's the, the name of the Mass. But the Palestrina Mass is one of the most glorious, um, glorious pieces of music written um, ever by man. It is just, it is just beautiful. You need to listen to it right now. At, well, not right now, obviously, after the stream's done. And then also in order, uh, he, he brought back and revived the beauty uh, in the vestments. He single-handedly, there used to be a very a particular lace industry in the area of Venice that had been dying. And he found a woman who was an old lady who was still able to, uh, to make lace in a certain way because it basically had died out because people hadn't really been buying lace. I guess, but he single-handedly revived it by making uh, a lot of the vestments for the for the priests and everybody else in in the area to be made of lace, because uh, as we know, more lace, more grace. Um, lace vestments are just absolutely glorious. And then um, tragedy struck while he was, but I'm going to check the chat real quick to make sure. Just send money to my address. Do a Pope Pius money give away all the money to me? Historically, Venice was very closely to Greek Orthodox world that cause of affairs. Just remember when Constantinople falls, only the Venetian have tried to help them. Yeah, it's really interesting how uh, Greek the, the Venetians were. No woman canters based.
Missa Pape Marcelli. That's what it is. That's what it is. No Nova Sword of Estimates. No, only Lace. More Lace, more Grace. Okay. And then the tragedy struck, as I said. So at, uh, at Venice, they had this very famous arch, this very, very famous arch. And uh, it, it had some sort of uh, significance to the Catholic faith. I can't exactly remember uh, what the significance was. But there was very important arch that was there. And the arch had crumbled and fell when he was the patriarch of Venice. So absolute tragedy because this was a very old arch that they had. So because of uh, Pope Pius's, uh, well, this time, just, just Patriarch Pius, uh, Patriarch Pius's um, connections with the government, he got the king of Italy to donate a bunch of money to, to the rebuilding of the arch. So he, he collected all the money, got the arch rebuilt, and then they had the opening of the arch. And interestingly enough, as, as I told you before, with the fighting between the church and the state, the state sent a representative. He was the Duke, I can't remember, the Duke of Turin. He was the Duke of Turin. That was his name. And this was kind of like a, a like an East meets West sort of like very intense meeting that they, that had occurred. The Duke of Turin meets the Patriarch of Venice and, and they met. And uh, obviously there was strong tensions at this time because, you know, the, the church and the state were split and the, the Pope turned his back to Rome and all, all that stuff. And the prisoner of the, the Vatican and everything like that. And they met and pious. He was such a charming guy and people loved him so much that the Duke of Turin just loved Pius. The Duke of Turin was like, Pius is the, the best man ever. And church and state relations, relations boom, they're, they're, they're healed and we're best friends. Is that's, that's in a sense what happened. I mean, the, the whole fighting between the, the Vatican and the rest of Rome still, still went on. But, uh, but the Duke of Turin was so impressed by him that went back, he went back to the state and strongly complimented how great Pius was is he was just able to make friends with everybody. And then even as even as a cardinal, this is uh, this is finishing up, but even as a cardinal, uh, what what's very important is that he very frequently fulfilled the duties of a parish priest. He would uh, say mass, obviously, um, for for people. He would carry communion to the sick. he he would frequently hear confessions. He would give spiritual exercises. He'd visit prisons. He'd visit hospitals. Um, he would preach to inmates. He would he would do all this stuff of the duties of a normal parish priest, even while being uh, while having all of those extra duties that he had as a cardinal and as a patriarch of Venice. He was just I, I can't even extol how how great uh, Pius was as as just a just a uh, pastor of the church. He was just a, a great man, which makes sense why he was uh, why he was canonized as a saint, because he wasn't only a a great defender of the faith in fighting against the the uh, the horrors of modernism in fighting against the uh, absolute gangrene to the Catholic faith. That is modernism. But he also was just a just a very nice guy. And uh, to finish it off, uh, a very interesting story. So Pius would, um, as he had before, I guess this isn't really a story, it's just a description, but he would go around the country to various uh, monasteries and parishes. And because during this time there, there was photography, but uh, everybody didn't know how Pius looked like, he would just sneak around. He would go to churches, he'd visit people, he'd help the poor, he would dress in a simple black cassock and just go out incognito out uh, into the streets helping people because that is just how amazing of a guy uh, Pope St. Pius X was. So that is all I have, and I'll see whether there are any comments before I go. How many is two Canadian dollars? Very curious. Oh man, your boy's rich now. Okay, I don't see any comments. 
So thank you, and I will not have any more streams tonight. So if you have any questions or would have any ideas for future stream, make sure you reach out to me. Uh, my I think my DMs are open on Twitter, so just DM me, um, or you can uh, Discord me. Just ping me or uh, or message me on Discord. Uh, make sure uh, if you want to become a patron and be an absolute giga chad, go to patreon.com slash militant thomas. Uh, follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and the like. And I think that's about all. Do oh, I see one comment? Two Canadian dollars is 150 US dollars. Oh, a dollar fifty. Dang it. You 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 got me real quick right there. Okay. I will see you guys later. Goodbye.